Hello, and welcome to the Commission on Peace Officer Standards and Training, Peace Officer Certification Workshop Number 1. This is the first in a series of four workshops that will examine the implications of Senate Bill 2 for the peace officer profession, with specific emphasis on changes to the selection standards and the background investigation process. We welcome you all and hope that you will find this workshop informative and valuable for your work moving forward. A quick note about this workshop and Senate Bill 2, which will be referred to as SB2 for brevity and clarity. It is not an exaggeration to say that SB2 is one of the most impactful pieces of legislation directed at California peace officers in recent decades. SB2 is wide ranging and complex, and there are a number of important aspects of SB2 which will not be discussed during this workshop. We encourage all interested parties to read the text of SB2 for themselves and evaluate how those changes might impact your role and the profession. This workshop is not intended to be an exhaustive recitation of SB2 and will not cover all aspects of SB2. For example, SB2 made changes to qualified immunity, which all peace officers should research and understand. Additionally, there were important changes made with respect to peace officer personnel files and disclosure criteria under the California Public Records Act. This presentation is focused only on relevant changes to the hiring and selection process of peace officers. Additionally, as with any significant piece of new legislation, there are likely certain aspects and details about the applicability of certain provisions of SB2, which will remain unanswered without further analysis. This course should not be construed as legal advice. Questions and advice about the specific provisions of SB2, including the applicability to given circumstances, should be discussed with competent legal counsel. On your screen, you will see a link to the SB2 portion of the POST website. This website contains important additional information and resources, including course materials which may help you to further your understanding of the Peace Officer Certification process. This website is where POST will add additional information and updates as they become available, and we encourage you to check this website frequently for new information. We also encourage you to sign up to receive alerts and information via email through the POST Pass system. Information about this system can be found on the main POST webpage. We have a number of goals as we move through this presentation. Our first goal is to provide everyone with a very general, broad overview of SB2, with a particular focus on the changes to the selection standards and hiring process. The second goal is to dispel any myths about the role of POST. As we have traveled the state doing training, we often hear about a number of misconceptions that the field has about the role of POST with respect to SB2. By the end of these series of workshops, you should all be very familiar with the role of your agencies and the role of POST. Finally, this presentation seeks to address any lingering questions about the role of POST and the impacts of SB2. Hopefully, you have all reviewed SB2, and in doing so, you have undoubtedly developed questions about it. This will be our attempt to answer some of the most common questions we get during live trainings. When we lay out the various components of SB2 and look at it in the broad sense, it should start to become a little clearer about how they are all related to each other. SB2 touched on many aspects of a peace officer career, including hiring and selection, appointments, misconduct investigations, and decertification. When POST first began trying to understand SB2, we broke the legislation down into the topic areas that you see here. You can see from this slide that there are aspects of SB2 that impact every phase of a career, from pre-service with the hiring and selection of peace officers, through the appointment process, and a new certification scheme. Once an officer has completed the necessary hiring, selection, and training requirements, they will be working as a newly certified officer in California. While working, they need to be cognizant of a new important concept called serious misconduct, a term that we will revisit later in this presentation. In the event that there is an allegation of serious misconduct alleged against the officer, there will be an investigative process followed by multiple layers of review ultimately culminating with decertification or suspension if warranted. While decertification or suspension is the last step in this graphic, it is important to understand that these certification actions will necessarily impact any subsequent hiring and selection of that peace officer. While there has been a lot of concern around serious misconduct allegations and the decertification process, 
I think it is helpful to remind ourselves that for the vast majority of the peace officers in the state of California, this will be the sum total of their experience with SB2. For those officers currently working, the changes to the hiring and selection standards and appointment process will largely be moot. For those officers who are new to the profession and not currently certified, they will automatically be issued a proof of eligibility, and this will serve as their license unless or until it is replaced by a basic certificate. Officers will then proceed through their careers, and our hope and expectation is that they will have a long, happy, healthy career where they go do good work in their communities and they can be proud of the work that they do. Eventually, they will choose to leave the profession, and after a few minor changes to the separation process, these officers will separate service. When looking at the implications of SB2, it can be helpful to first ask ourselves the fundamental question as to why we do peace officer backgrounds in California. We often ask this question in the live courses, and we are met with a wide range of acceptable answers to include risk management, liability reduction, and ensuring that the applicant is a good fit for the agency. Some students rightfully conclude that we do backgrounds to comply with post regulations. And while this is true in a strict sense, it is also worth noting and remembering that one of the primary fundamental reasons for conducting background investigations is to comply with state law. Under Government Code Section 1031, agencies who employ peace officers must ensure that the applicant is of good moral character as determined through a thorough background investigation. Issues of good moral character are examined through a lens of post background dimensions and by utilizing the background investigation manual while questions as to thoroughness of the background within the meaning of 1031 can be assessed against post regulations, notably regulation 1950 through 1955. This relationship between the law and post regulations and guidelines is important to keep in mind as we progress through the remainder of this workshop. Often, we will refer to legal requirements placed upon the agency, and it is incumbent upon the agency to ensure compliance with these legal requirements irrespective of a specific regulation or guidance which speaks to it. If your agency has any questions as to the applicability of a specific law to your circumstances, we would encourage you to seek the advice of competent legal counsel. SB2 and its companion, SB16, included a number of important law changes that agencies must incorporate into their hiring selection process and examination. Here, you will see a partial list of the most significant code changes and we will place particular emphasis on the changes to Government Code Section 1029, Penal Code Section 832.12, and Penal Code Section 13510.9. As it is the first evaluation agencies are likely conduct to conduct, let's first discuss the changes to Government Code Section 1029. Generally speaking, Government Code Section 1029 can be thought of as the list of disqualifiers to becoming a peace officer in the state of California. Most peace officers and background investigators are familiar with and aware of the prohibition on becoming a peace officer if you have ever been convicted of a felony. In addition to the standard disqualifying felony convictions, there are a number of new changes introduced with SB2 that agencies must ensure are being screened for as part of the background investigation process. It is critical that background investigators and hiring authorities understand that the changes to Government Code Section 1029 discussed here apply to any new hires since January 1st, 2022. While many of the provisions of SB2 become operative January 1st of 2023, the changes discussed here are operative for any new appointment since January 1st of 2022. If there are any questions as to whether or not your new applicants have been screened appropriately, it is incumbent upon you to ensure eligibility for peace officer appointment. Agencies must always bear in mind that the following disqualifiers are exactly that, disqualifiers. These government code provisions speak to whether or not an applicant can be hired, not whether they should be hired. Even if an applicant is not otherwise disqualified, Agencies must still make an assessment in compliance with the previously mentioned Government Code 1031 and post requirements to ensure that the applicant is both suitable for a peace officer position and suitable for your particular agency. Just because an applicant is not otherwise disqualified does not mean that the agency is obligated to hire them as a peace officer. The first Government Code change to discuss is 1029A3. 
Any person who has been discharged from the military for committing an offense as adjudicated by a military tribunal, which would have been a felony if committed in this state. The next important change is displayed here. 1029A4C. Effective January 1st of 2022, any person who has been convicted of a crime in accordance with this paragraph shall not regain eligibility for peace officer employment based upon the nature of any sentence ordered or imposed. In addition, no such person shall regain eligibility for peace officer employment based upon any later order of the court setting aside, vacating, withdrawing, expunging, or otherwise dismissing or reversing the conviction unless the court finds the person to be factually innocent of the crime for which they were convicted at the time of the entry of the order. The next important change is highlighted here. 1029A9. Any person who, following exhaustion of all available appeals, has been convicted of or adjudicated through an administrative, military, or civil judicial process requiring not less than clear and convincing evidence, including a hearing that meets the requirements of the administrative adjudication provisions of the Administrative Procedure Act, Chapter 3.5, commencing with Section 11340 of Part 1 of Division 3 of Title 2, as having committed any act that is a violation of Section 115, 115.3, 116, 116.5, or 117 of or of any offense described in Chapter 1, commencing with Section 92, Chapter 5, commencing with Section 118, Chapter 6, commencing with Section 132, or Chapter 7, commencing with Section 142 of Title 7 of Part 1 of the Penal Code including any act committed in another jurisdiction that would have been a violation of any of these sections if committed in this state. This change is perhaps one of the most difficult sections to interpret and apply. Some important aspects of this section to consider are that with few exceptions, there are no databases one can query to ensure that an applicant is not disqualified under this section. When conducting a thorough background, agencies and investigators must ensure that they are asking relevant questions of the applicant, secondary references, previous employers, and conducting thorough assessments of anywhere the applicant has ever lived or worked. Additionally, while not explicitly cited, Post believes that these provisions apply to criminal convictions as well as the stated administrative, military, or civil judicial processes. This now implicates a number of specific misdemeanor provisions as disqualifiers. A thorough evaluation of an applicant's criminal history is imperative when making a suitability assessment. The next change to Government Code Section 1029 is highlighted here. Any person who has been issued the certification described in Section 13510.1 of the Penal Code and has had that certification revoked by the Commission on Peace Officer Standards and Training, has voluntarily surrendered that certification pursuant to Subdivision F of Section 13510.8, or having met the minimum requirement for issuance of certification, has been denied issuance of certification. For the purpose of this section, it is important to understand the distinction between disqualified and decertified. Under the new provisions of SB2 and Penal Code Section 13510.9, all peace officers who are disqualified shall be decertified. And now, under Government Code Section 1029, all peace officers who are decertified shall be disqualified from peace officer appointment. There are still certain classifications of peace officers in California who are bound by the provisions of Government Code Section 1029, but who are not otherwise required to be certified under SB2. If you have any questions as to whether the government code or peace officer certification applies to your classification of peace officers, I encourage you to review workshop number two or speak with a post representative directly. In order to make this assessment, agencies will need to query post about the certificate status of any potential appointment. 
information about decertification actions, including how background investigators can get access to decertification information, will be discussed later in this workshop. The final change to Government Code Section 1029 is shown here, 1029A11. Any person previously employed in law enforcement in any state or United States territory or by the federal government whose name is listed in the National Decertification Index of the International Association of Directors of Law Enforcement Standards and Training or any other database designated by the federal government whose certification as a law enforcement officer in that jurisdiction was revoked for misconduct or who, while employed as a law enforcement officer, engaged in serious misconduct that would have resulted in their certification being revoked by the commission if employed as a peace officer in this state. This final change deals with officers who have been decertified outside of California for misconduct and or who have committed serious misconduct while employed as a peace officer in another state. Two important aspects should be kept in mind when assessing this disqualifier. First and foremost, background investigators and agencies must understand what constitutes serious misconduct, as any admission by officers of prior serious misconduct behavior is potentially disqualifying under this section. Secondly, agencies must understand that this prohibition bars any officer who has been decertified for misconduct, whether or not that conduct would qualify as serious misconduct in California. This section also requires agencies to check the National Decertification Index, which will be discussed later in this workshop. As mentioned previously, when assessing applicants with previous law enforcement experience, it is vital that agencies and investigators understand the types of behaviors that qualify as serious misconduct. As a reminder, under Government Code Section 1029, applicants with previous law enforcement experience who disclose acts of serious misconduct that would have resulted in their certification being revoked in California are disqualified, irrespective of whether or not that specific behavior actually led to decertification in their previous employment. Examples of serious misconduct are shown on your screen and further defined under Post Regulation 1205 and Penal Code Section 13510.8. Serious misconduct includes dishonesty, abuse of power, physical abuse, sexual assault, demonstrating bias, acts that violate the law that are sufficiently egregious or repeated, participation in a law enforcement gang, failure to cooperate with an investigation into potential police misconduct, and failing to intercede in the use of force. All of these terms are defined in much more detail in post-regulation in the Penal Code, and we would encourage you to read those if you have any questions about whether or not your applicant is subject to disqualification under this section. One final note regarding the relationship between peace officer disqualifiers and the criminal history checks conducted as part of the background. Agencies and investigators are cautioned that they cannot rely on a firearms clearance as a proxy for a criminal history clearance. There are many disqualifiers listed under Government Code Section 1029, which would not be disclosed on a criminal history and would not prevent your applicant from possessing a firearm in the state of California. Background investigators and agencies must ensure a thorough assessment of all aspects in making an eligibility determination. We will now focus in a little more on some changes to the background process more relevant for those officers with previous law enforcement experience, both in state and out of state, and regardless of whether or not they are currently working for an agency. We mentioned earlier in the workshop that SB2 is some of the most significant legislation that we have seen with respect to peace officer hiring and selection in recent years. A critical aspect of the legislation is the addition of several new requirements on post and hiring agencies to help prevent the hiring of peace officers with previous serious misconduct allegations, including officers who were terminated for serious misconduct. Along these lines, there are three main areas that we should be aware of. Number one, the National Decertification Index. Number two, Penal Code Section 832.12, and agency inquiries to post for information about previous separations or for any reports of serious misconduct reported to post pursuant to SB2. Taking them in order, we will first discuss the National Decertification Index. The National Decertification Index is a database that is maintained by the International Association 
of Directors of Law Enforcement Standards and Training. The NDI database is accessed via the iAtalyst website by following the link in the lower left-hand corner. Once you click on the NDI link, it will open a page that you see here, and this will allow you to submit a request to NDI for access. You can see from the screen that the link for California agencies is highlighted in red. If you follow that link, you will be asked to provide some basic information, including your name, agency, post ID number, and supervisor information. Once submitted, the application will be forwarded to post for review and approval. You should know for access to be granted, you must be listed on your post agency roster. If you are a civilian or part-time investigator who is not normally listed on your agency roster, please contact your EDI administrator and discuss being added as a BINV so that access may be granted. Once you are confirmed on your agency roster, POST will be able to approve your NDI application. The next change to be aware of are changes to Penal Code Section 832.12. Each department or agency in the state that employs peace officers shall make a record of any investigations of misconduct involving a peace officer in the officer's general personnel file or a separate file designated by the department or agency. A peace officer seeking employment with a department or agency in the state that employs peace officers shall give written permission for the hiring department or agency to view the officer's general personnel file and any separate file designated by a department or agency. Prior to employing any peace officer, each department or agency in the state that employs peace officers shall request and the hiring department or agency shall review any records made available pursuant to subdivision A. Agencies and investigators should note that this is a specific legal requirement and requires the hiring agency to review any records made available under this section. Agencies should ensure that they are conducting these reviews as POST will be reviewing the results of those checks during your annual background audit. Agencies and investigators should know that there are several new requirements under Penal Code Section 13510.9 with respect to backgrounds, and you should be aware of two new processes which are available from POST to assist investigators in complying with these requirements. First, before employing or appointing any peace officer who has previously been employed or appointed as a peace officer by another agency, the agency shall contact the commission to inquire as to the facts and reasons a peace officer became separated from any previous employing agency. The commission shall, upon request and without prejudice, provide any information regarding the separation in its possession. Secondly, POST is required to maintain serious misconduct reports and provide this information to the subject peace officer, the employing agency, and any agency performing a pre-employment background investigation. To assist agencies in accessing this information, there are two different platforms available to investigators. The first platform is the current EDI system where post profiles are maintained. From EDI, agencies will be able to view post profiles which contain all previous California law enforcement employment from post participating agencies, along with the dates and reasons for any previous separations. The post profile will also include information about the certification status of any previously certified officer, including whether or not that certification has ever been revoked or suspended. The other platform is a system on the post website called Next Request. This is a new system POST has implemented to address, among other things, public records requests. There is now a portion of next requests specifically configured to submit requests about any previous serious misconduct allegations and separations submitted to POST in compliance with SB2. Further information about this system can be found on the POST website. As you all are no doubt aware, EDI currently limits your ability to view post profiles to only those peace officers currently appointed to your agency. However, beginning no later than January 1st of 2023, applicants will be able to voluntarily share their profiles with any prospective agency conducting a background. The sharing of profiles is a two-step process. The first step in the process involves the applicant logging into their post pass account from the main post website. 
From here, they will be able to select an option to share their profile with any post participating agency listed in the system. From the list, applicants can select as many agencies as they wish, and they can set how long they want to share their profile. Once they have selected and shared the profile to an agency, there's nothing else the applicant needs to do. From the agency side, the agency will need to designate staff members with the necessary security permissions in EDI to be able to access profiles which have been shared with that agency. Who the agency selects is their decision, but they will need to submit a new post EDI access application requesting the specific authority to view pre-employment background profiles. Existing EDI users will not automatically have access to these profiles as it is its own security classification. Additional information about the sharing and viewing of profiles is available via post bulletins. Another important component and change that was included with SB2 is the concept of an immediate temporary suspension. Under this authority, outlined in Penal Code Section 13510.8, the post executive director shall issue an immediate temporary suspension if they find that it is in the best interest of the health, safety, or welfare of the public. These suspensions may be issued under three circumstances and will be reflected on the applicant's post profile if issued. The executive director may issue a suspension for arrest or indictment under any of the provisions of disqualifiers under Government Code Section 1029, discharge for grounds listed under Government Code Section 1029, or in those cases where the officer is separated from employment pending investigation into allegations of serious misconduct. When evaluating lateral applicants or applicants with previous law enforcement experience, agencies should be cautioned about ensuring that there is not the potential for an immediate temporary suspension to be issued by post upon separation. With the myriad changes to the background process required under SB2, along with the changes required in compliance with a number of other changes to the law, POST has developed a new Verification of Qualification for Peace Officer Appointment Form, which is now required to be completed by the hiring authority and included in the background file. This new form essentially serves as a checklist to help agencies ensure compliance with the relevant legal and regulatory requirements for peace officer appointments. This form is required to be signed by the hiring authority or their designee and should be completed prior to the appointment of any peace officer. This form stays with the background file and will be reviewed during the annual background file audit. Questions and instructions on the completion of this form are included in the post bulletin published at the form's release. Finally, agencies and investigators should be looking for changes to the personal history statement and the background investigators manual around the 1st of 2023. If you are not aware, all background investigators will be required to have completed post-approved background investigator training no later than July 1st of 2023. We thank you for your time and attention, and we hope that you have enjoyed this workshop focused on the hiring and selection standard changes under SB2. If you have not done so already, we would encourage you to view the remaining workshops for additional information that may be relevant for your particular assignment. We also encourage everyone to check the POST SB2 website frequently and make sure you have activated your POST Pass account and are signed up to receive updates.